This is Dan Schneider, and on this Dan Schneider video interview, I will be having the second of my visionary or fraud debates. A few months ago, I had a debate on the life and career of evolutionary biologist Richard Dawkins. This time up, the subject will be scientist and inventor Ray Kurzweil. The two debaters that you see before you are Nikola Danilov and Norman Ball, and the debate will begin in just a moment. All right, uh, in this first segment, I want to introduce the two panelists slash debaters. On the left of the screen, you will see Nikola Danilov. On the right, you will see Norman Ball. Norman has appeared once before on one of my shows on a show about the art of essay writing. Nikola Danilov, however, uh, is making his first appearance, and he runs a website called singularityweblog.com, where he also does a lot of interviews, mostly, I think, with technological people. So, uh, Nicola, if you would uh, like to introduce yourself, who you are, your website, and your opinion on Ray Kurzweil, please. So, first of all, you can call me Nick, guys. Uh, it's okay. going to simplify things a lot. Uh, secondly, I'm just a blogger and a podcaster. Um, I've been doing it for about six plus years now, it would appear, uh, <laughs> which is kind of mind-blowing when I come to think of it. Uh, my blog, as you said, is singularityweblog.com, and my podcast is Singularity One on One, which is available on YouTube, iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher Radio, pretty much most places. Uh, my kind of take or reason for taking on blogging and podcasting was twofold. Uh, first of all, uh, it started with a failure, and that was the failure to find a job. Uh, basically, I graduated a master's degree uh, at the peak of the recession, and I stopped counting after sending 300 resumes. One of those resumes, however, was to uh, another blog called Singularity Hub, and uh, basically they had a, an open call for staff writers, and having waited for a couple of weeks without any reply, it suddenly occurred to me that perhaps I can do this on my own. and. There we go. So six and a half years later, I find myself being a professional blogger and podcaster. I'm the biggest independent blog uh, in the niche of the singularity and transhumanism. Uh, I'm also the only podcast of its kind on the same topics. Uh, and my take on things is generally the Socratic dialectical method of investigation which is to say my goal is to set the context or the environment in which ideally if I have done my job right, my viewers and my audience would come up with their own ideas. In other words, I do have an opinion of my own, which I don't hide, but I don't try to enforce it on anybody. I just try to usually use it as a talking point uh, and let people make up their own mind. And basically, the questions that I tried to answer for the past six or seven years are, uh, broadly speaking, what does it mean to be human and how does technology uh, change both the question and the answer to that question? And when I say what does it mean to be human, I mean both in a personal sense, me as an individual, but I also mean in collective sense for us as a species. Uh, Nicola, uh before I just ask you your opinion on Kurzweil, uh, since you're a specialist and, and this is a more general uh, show, could you just explain the term transhumanism to someone who may not have heard of it before? Transhumanism is generally the belief that science and technology have made, can make, and will continue to make our lives better. Okay. And uh, so people know you are basically taking sort of the, the pro- uh, version, the pro Kurzweil version in this debate against Norm's Khan. So if you could tell uh, just a little bit about uh, uh, your own interactions with Kurzweil, if you've met him, uh, what your opinion of his life and career, etc. are, and then we'll uh, go over to Norm. All right. So, so basically, uh, Ray Kurzweil, first of all, has had a fundamental impact on my life. What do I mean by that? So I was doing a master's uh, degree thesis research uh, when I was at uh, York University and uh, I was looking, uh, I was a student in international relations and uh, with a focus on armed conflict. 
So I was looking for kind of a fresh new topic that will be a little bit different than the usual World War One or World War Two or something like that, where there's been literally, you know, jungle forests cut down to to publish books that usually no one ever reads. Uh, and so I decided to write a thesis on artificial intelligence in times of war, in, uh, and where I was focusing on the drone warfare in Iraq and Afghanistan. That was around 2006, 2007 when I started that research, and at the time, the U.S. military was the only military in the world that was fielding such drones, and they only had about a dozen or two at the most. Uh, it was a very new research, not much written about it, not much done on the topic. As part of my research, I discovered Ray Kurzweil's book, The Singularity is Near, and which was published three or four years before that. And having read it, basically, I thought that everything I knew, it, it basically broke my mind in a way, like in a good way that kind of opened up any sort of previous impossibilities to me and, and kind of made me question everything that I have taken for solid and for granted and for inflexible and unchangeable and internal in a way. Uh, then that book was followed, uh, which is a, this book is a nonfiction book and it's a very sort of uh, solid book. It has maybe, I don't know, a hundred pages of references. Uh, it was followed by another book, which kind of is on the same topic, but from the science fiction point of view, written by Charlie Strauss, which is called Accelerando. And Accelerando kind of gave meat to sort of the skeleton of Ray Kurzweil's uh, scientific argument. Charlie Strauss basically gave sort of a literally embodiment and life, if you will, to raise ideas about the singularity. And those two books basically together uh, uh, blew out my mind to the point where, you know, I, I decided to, to dig deeper and to kind of devote my life, at least for the next few years, into investigating some of the questions and the issues raised uh, in, in that kind of work. Um, now, personally speaking, I've met uh, Ray Kurzweil on several occasions, and uh, I did a, an in-person interview with him maybe four years ago in his office in Boston, um, and my impression of him was that, he, you know, I've done 175 interviews with some of the smartest people from around the world, and Ray is the biggest discrepancy between uh, an accomplishment and ego, in my opinion, in my personal experience. And what I mean by that is that he is a brilliant inventor with an amazing history of accomplishments in a variety of fields, from music to object recognition to a variety of other artificial intelligence, voice recognition, and so on. And yet, when I was doing my interview with him, and I was late uh, because... Boston was in kind of like a big sort of a traffic jam situation. I was late by probably 45 minutes. I, I took m much longer time to set up the interview. Uh, basically, I took over his office. I moved all his furniture. <laughs> I, I, I did everything that I wanted to do, and he never said anything uh, bad or negative or stopped me. He never behaved like a superstar. He never behaved like a like a, you know, like a prima donna, he was so humble and, and so kind of eager or, or happy to, to just let me do uh, what I wanted to do uh, and, and sort of so generous in, in giving his time for that. And so to me personally, I was blown away by this man whose time was very valuable and whose time basically I stole about three hours of his time for which I felt very guilty, to be honest with you. Uh, and so... Going back to the point, Ray Kurzweil to me uh, has had a tremendous impact on my life. Personally speaking, I think he's a very humble man, which speaks volumes for him. Uh, in terms of his intellectual work, it has had an enormous impact on me. I absolutely consider him to be a visionary. However, that does not mean to say that he is necessarily correct or right. And it does not mean to say that I necessarily agree with everything he says or he claims. Uh, and, and by the way, as uh, our conversation evolves, you will see that I myself have evolved substantially since my original positions 
which kind of uh, made me begin this journey on the singularity. Okay, one final question before I ask Norm. I remember when I, originally we were going to do this a few months ago, but something came up. Um, I remember you had objected to the title of this debate uh, series of visionary or fraud. Uh, did, do you still have an objection to that? Because you did say that you take the, the position that he's a, a visionary. So I just wanted to give you a chance to just clear that up. Well, may, may I just oh. quickly interject? Uh, oh. and, and of course, Nick's, Nick can take over. Okay. I, I'm going to say something briefly on that, that as well. I'm going to issue a bit of a disclaimer on the, the, the title of the debate. But go ahead, Nick. No, no, you can, you can do it. Well, I, would, would you like me to start my... Uh, yeah, go, go ahead. One, 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 Norm Ball, just so people know... Your, your website is fullspectrumdominoes.wordpress.com, and both both of your websites will be linked below this video. So go ahead, Norm, introduce yourself. Well, you know, I, had I known that uh, Nick was formally trained in armed conflict, you did not tell me this, Dan. I would have brought a sidearm. I just have rhetorical, you know, grenades, but uh, that's very interesting, uh, Dan. Uh, I, uh, I did watch the... Uh, the Kurzweil debate uh, with Nick, uh, and it was it was fascinating, and, and I got that sense uh, of uh, uh, Kurzweil's approachability and, and his and his his humanity, which is sort of ironic because we're talking about, in my opinion, one of the greatest threats to humanism, although it borrows the word itself, trans transhumanism. Uh, but but by way of uh, segue here, I'll. I'll I guess I'll introduce myself uh, and, and give a, a brief spiel. Uh, I'm an author, an essayist, a cultural critic, critic, uh, post beat writer, a playwright, a poet. No, no, please, not not in that order, whichever order you prefer. I majored in political science and economics at Washington University. I went on to get an MBA in finance at George Washington University. Spent about 20 years in satellites and telecommunication industries, uh, and then I embarked on a consulting career in IT, program management, privacy management, uh, business development. I've assisted numerous industries uh, across a, a broad swath in those various capacities. I'm very much a generalist, uh, and uh, my writings have ranged from geopolitics to literature to the current financial dilemmas of the day. I think Dan ran across, although Dan and I have crossed paths before, I think he ran across some of my transhuman essays here and there on the internet, hence, uh, you know, my appearance here in the, in, in the hot seat. Uh, but I'm, I'm a generalist, uh, but I'm very engaged and very fascinated by this, this debate, and I think every human being has an obligation uh, to, to, to engage it. Uh, it, it. It is nothing short of uh, the, probably the most radically disruptive uh, uh, technology and, uh, and, and worldview that has ever confronted humanity. That's a good reason to, 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 to gain broad uh, uh, to, to, to create a broad debate. Uh, I want to say that I'm, I'm, I'm really I'm honored. Uh, I'm humbled and I'm frankly a little bit trepidatious uh, to, to be asked to hold up the skeptical end of this Kurzweil visionary or fraud debate uh, with Nick, whose interview series I'm no stranger to. I, I watch them with great fascination and, and Nick uh, routinely holds his own with uh, some of the greatest minds on this planet. Uh, they're fascinating. Um, I'm singularly unqualified to participate beyond uh, the, the fact my, my humanity alone is, is really my, my entree here, and so I'm very privileged, uh, and I, I look forward to learning things, and I don't expect to disabuse Nicholas of, uh, Nicola of, of frankly, uh, anything. Uh, I, uh, I, I did want to state my, my own, uh, we were getting to that, this, I will just state a disclaimer, in effect, and that is that I, I, as we talked about, we sort of had a mini offline debate over the weeks, uh, the prior weeks before we, we came here today. Uh, I, I, I don't like the term fraud. I'm a little resistant to that. It, it implies malfeasance, implies even maybe an illegal activity. Uh, I make no such claims against Ray Kurzweil. In fact, uh, I, I'm quite in awe of him. Uh, he's a prodigious uh, inventor. Uh, he, he, with a, a resume that stretches back literally to his childhood. So he is prodigious. He was a prodigy. Uh, he's got a peculiar and, and a very durable genius that has survived over decades, stretches back uh, to, to, to his early years. Uh, so, so I want to, really, my interest is not an ad hominem discussion of Ray Kurzweil.
as well. My fascination, and I would think most people's, would be uh, to separate the spokesman from this very critical body of knowledge, this movement called transhumanism. Uh, and I think that's where the interest would lie. And, and, and it, it's, it's potential to be radically disruptive and to challenge the most fundamental tenets of what we call humanism, uh, even as it uses that term and expropriates that term for its own. So that, that's basically my little synopsis in a nutshell. Okay. Uh, Nicola, do you want to add anything to, to Norm's claim about the title? Yeah, I, I have to say uh, uh, basically things, two things at two separate levels. So first of all, uh, per the title, uh, I totally agree with Norm, uh, Norman, and, and, and I want to say that I find it a little bit sensational. Uh, now, as a blogger and a podcaster, I can have sympathy for uh, trying to sort of, uh, you know, mobilize and gather some audience for, for what you do. But I'd like to also uh, caution you that it's a, it's a kind of a fine line. So, so and, and each of us makes, of course, that's an ethical decision that each of one makes individually, uh, how, where that line lies and how far along that line we want to push. Uh, so uh, I, I personally think that the fraud part is kind of uh, sensationalist uh, to being like cheaply sensationalist uh, and highly unjustified and, and unwarranted. Um, as per the sort of, and as I said, uh, to me, uh, Ray Kurzweil is a visionary, but that doesn't make him necessarily right or correct in everything that he says or he's done. But uh, the, the second point I want to make is a little bit kind of maybe more subversive, if you will, to the format that we're about to undergo, perhaps. Uh, you know, I've done a few debates in my time, and I've learned that people don't learn during debates. Um, debates become, have the tendency to become very personal. Uh, it, they get to the point where it's not really about the content and the ideas and learning and knowledge or satiating curiosity, but uh, it becomes about winning. It becomes about ego. Uh, it becomes about who wins, who looks better in the end, uh, which is very different from, from the content and from learning. And so, which is why I've embraced personally the Socratic approach, even though Socrates was a great debater himself, because I find there's more value in conversation. Conversation, it's easier to transcend egos. It's easier to focus it on uh, the substance rather than the personalities. Uh, and uh, I find that people learn in a conversation a lot more than they learn in debate. And I've almost never seen people change their minds in a debate. But I've seen people change their mind or at least beginning to change their mind in a conversation. Um, well, if I, if I do change my mind, I promise to email both of you gentlemen after the debate. That's my, I, I will offer that guarantee. But in fairness to Dan, I want to say also, Dan's got to sell newspapers, so it is a lurid headline. Uh, and as, as Nick suggests, it's a little bit tabloid, but that's, that's, that's marketing and promotion. Uh, you know, uh, so, so I, I understand uh, where Dan is coming from. And, and uh, but, but I think, yes, I agree with Nick, that the cult of personality, uh, I think this, I frankly think this issue, although it's almost impossible to discuss transhumanism without addressing Ray Kurzweil, he is the, if you will, the poster child in, in, in the best sense of that, of that term. Uh, at the same time, this is, a, this is an eclipsing moment in human history, and all, all personalities are, 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 are sub subordinate to, to the importance of the movement itself. Yeah, and that's why in that sense I, I'd also uh, like to, as I was saying, debates tend to make things personal, and we want to, I personally at least am more interested in the substance. That's why I think, while I agree that Ray Kurzweil is a pivotal persona within that discussion, hopefully we can transcend his uh, personality and actually go above and beyond and focus on the ideas and the substance uh, rather than just get sort of entangled in, in a sort of a more narrow uh, debate about the person.
Okay, uh, let me just, uh, let's end this segment and we'll get into the debate in a moment. I just want to clear up two points. Number one, uh, when I say a debate, obviously we're not following international debating society rules. Um, and, you know, no one's going to be cut off at like, you know, 90 seconds or something. This isn't like the old William F. Buckley debates. So it is it is really a conversation, just sort of structured so that we don't go on for like 90 minutes just soliloquizing. Um, and uh, uh, the this is the, the reason I'm taping this and we're not just doing this by, by ourselves is so that people who don't know of Ray Kurzweil will learn from two different opinions. Uh, so I'm not interested in norm uh, changing Nick's mind or vice versa. I'm, you know, the reality is that most of the people who are going to be interested in uh, uh, Bruce Jenner or uh, celebrity nipple slips are not going to have a clue who Ray Kurzweil is. So let's not kid ourselves. Um, as far as the title, uh, the reason I chose that and Initially, I was going to have three three debates, which would have been the first one was going to be on Noam Chomsky, the second on Dawkins, and this the third. Uh, I don't know if I'm ever even going to get to a Chomsky debate, but uh, uh, the reason is because the pro and con people of all three of these men have uh, in the media always thrown these two terms about. So it just seemed a natural for for all three of them, visionary or fraud, since the the most extreme uh, people on each end have have used that. Um, so that's the reason that was chosen. Um, well, may, I, may I say, uh, yeah. may I say, Dan, and, and I, I believe, yeah, I, I agree. This, this, the more rigid, you know, twenty minutes to Nick, twenty minutes to me. I, I would prefer like interjections, natural interjections. Yeah. When something is, is said that just prompts the other individual to say something. Number one, number two, Richard Dawkins has really become a a media celebrity, and and almost, uh, you know, he, he he's kind of incendiary by design. I mean, I find him, you know, particularly what Nick is confirming, what I suspected about Ray Kurzweil on a personal level, he's much more self-effacing. Uh, you know, Dawkins is a, has become a pit bull in a lot of ways, and, and, and sort of, I think he's tarnished his his bona fides as a, as a scientist, uh, but, but that's only, that's my opinion. Well, my, my, let, let's just end. my opinion, the reason I'm doing it is, uh, and I stated this at the Dawkins debate, is that while I agreed agree with 99% of Dawkins' scientific opinions, I have a, a problem with the way he presents it. And similarly with Chomsky and his political opinions, or Kurzweil and his sort of uh, predictions of doom and uploading uh, human beings, I, I, I have some fundamental issues with that. But nonetheless, let's end this segment. And in the next segment, uh, if, if you two fellows, and I'll just ask you, I guess, right here on camera, do you feel that you've made your cases and do you want to go into the questioning of each other or do you want to have five or ten minutes to further broaden your pro and con cases? I, I think I've won. I mean, look, why, why don't we just... Okay. Done? How, about, how about you, Nick? Uh, would, exactly. would you want to go into questioning, Norm, in the next segment right off? Well, let's let's kind of lay a little bit of the foundation. Okay. Maybe, a little more so that we can kind of learn from, uh, from each other a little bit or okay. for each other and, and let our audience do the same perhaps. All right, well, we'll do that in a moment. All right, in this segment, Nick and Norm will uh, a bit further elaborate their opinions on Ray Kurzweil and his ideas and his career. Nick is going to go first, so the floor is yours, Nick. Thank you, Dan. So, basically, we cannot talk about the, the idea of the technological singularity uh, and perhaps transhumanism, though a little bit less so, uh, without throwing in the name of Ray Kurzweil somewhere there. And basically, he has become the embodiment or uh, the ambassador or the prophet, depending on point of view, of those ideas. And simply put, what he is saying is that the changes that we are going to witness in the next several decades will, cumulatively speaking, be bigger, deeper, and more radical than the changes that we have witnessed since the beginning of humanity. And those changes will be so profound, so deep, and so fundamental that the metaphor that we embrace to sort of uh, uh, represent the idea of that uh, transition 
is uh, borrowed from physics and and it's a black hole it's a singularity and and uh, a, a black hole you know a singularity in mathematics is a problem with undefined answers so five divided by zero is is an example um in uh, in linguistics or in language a singularity is is something uh, unique singular uh one of a kind in uh, physics a singularity is a black hole it's a place where uh, the laws of the universe as we know them don't hold true anymore where light cannot escape probably and uh, we cannot peer beyond the event horizon and so it's that moment uh, that event horizon which uh, kind of uh, is most associated with the Kurzweilian definition of the singularity, because what he's trying to say is that our ability to model the future literally will fall apart because everything will change so much, so much um, that it's impossible to predict what will happen next. And of course, one of the biggest, there's a number of reasons for that, but one of the biggest reasons is that we are no longer likely to be the smartest and or the only intelligent species on our planet. And chances are that uh, we may be even like the second smartest species by a long shot. And the question then is, what happens to us? What happens to humanity if and when machines become smarter than us? What happens to you when your toothbrush is smarter than you? So uh, there's also a variety of, 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 of endless sort of fundamental changes that are represented uh, uh, in what Kurzweil calls the law of accelerating returns, which is a little bit of a wider version of Moore's law. Moore's law basically says that every couple of years, the price performance of computing doubles. So, and we know that it's easy to see and observe everywhere. We know that every couple of years we buy a phone which is a better phone, which has a better camera. It usually has double the storage. The same with computer, the same with cameras, the same with most things. But most things nowadays are becoming computers. As I pointed earlier, even our toothbrushes. Everything is becoming computers. And of course, there's that same tendency, not only in computing, but it's being translated into a variety of other fields, such as 3D printing, nanotechnology, synthetic biology, genetics, robotics, artificial intelligence, which is exploding all around us. If we look at things such as self-driving car, uh, Siri, uh, and so on. And when you kind of aggregate the fundamental changes and the pace of acceleration in all those variety of disciplines, which is a say, which is a said, the pace is accelerating itself. Then, according to Ray, this all kind of reaches a crescendo, which he calls the singularity, and it's basically a point beyond which everything that we know of will change so radically and dramatically that we cannot see what happens next. Uh, Noam. Well, I take you know. There, there's a dystopian uh, uh, variation, Nick, on that, uh, that the idea of every appliance having, uh, you know, being a smart appliance. Uh, you know, your toaster will have an embedded microprocessor. Every app, every device. It already does. It already does. Every device and appliance will also become a surveillance device. We will be studied microscopically at, at, at every turn of our lives will be no way to escape the panopticon. I, I see a very dark vision. I am fascinated. You, you, you speak about change as though it's, it's, it's practically a given, and it always has been. The march of science has, has stopped for no man. Uh, I believe it's powered independently. It has its own impetus, uh, as Kevin Kelly suggests. Uh, it, it's, it's essentially evolutionary. It's, it's emulating biological processes. Uh, Kelly goes as far as to suggest that, that what he calls the technium or technology will become the seventh animal kingdom. And we're essentially 
and it will become the usurping kingdom. We are we are seeding it. We are the the, the attendants. I have a slightly different view of the singularity. I like I like recursive self improvement. When it, it's when machines will establish their autonomy from human beings and will then self replicate and perfect their own intelligence as an alien in, in ways that we can't even imagine. There, there's a fascinating quote by J.D.S. Haldane, the, the British biologist, that I always return to when speaking of the universe. Not only is the universe stranger than we imagine, the universe is stranger than we can imagine. And the singularity, the, the Kurzweilian singularity you're, you're speaking of, Nick, is precisely that. It is of such an alien form that we have the, the, the whole notion of control, which Stephen Hawking recently has, has uh, bemoaned. We, we, will, we as human beings will lose all control of this dynamic, uh, and we are enshrining it. Now, why are we enshrining? Why is change so, we, we, we speak of it as though it's, it's self-evident and inevitable. What is driving technology? Uh, it, it's not human beings. We, I, another way to view the singularity, it, it is the moment at which machines will divorce themselves from human beings. They have, up until now, they, they, they've provided us with seductions and entreaties. They've given us nice little gadgets that please our primate sensibilities. But that's not the end of technology. Technology has its own agenda. It's an evolutionary agenda. And, and we are the lung fish. We are the pioneer species. We may be the, the, the ceiling of the, what, uh, the, what's called the Animalia uh, animal kingdom. We are handing a baton. And I think Paul Davies calls it, uh, or is it Ted Chu calls it, the, the, to cosmic beings. Now, I'm not saying that, we're, we will, that the human race will perish through some sort of malevolence, not that, that sort of Hollywood Matrix type talk. Uh, I, I, I'm suggesting much more, much more possible. We will just simply wither away through indifference. Uh, you think of a, a dragonfly that flies across the highway when you're driving at 70 miles an hour, and it it gets smashed into your the grill of your automobile. You, you, there was no evil intent. In fact, you probably don't even notice it. You're oblivious to the fact you've just killed, you've decimated a, a dragonfly. We will probably, it's, it's probably more on, along the lines of benign neglect. Now, the other issue I have is that somehow at this singularity point, these, these machines that we've enshrined and unleashed will somehow pivot and turn backwards retrospectively and, and attend to our, our carbon-based cancers and, and strokes and, and, and bestow immortality upon us. I, don't, I, I would imagine they'll have entirely their own agenda. When was the last time you took a lungfish to lunch or bought him a drink to thank him for his pioneering spirit, for, for using his dual capacity of lungs and gills to climb up onto the, to belly up onto the, onto the bank and, to, and essentially to unleash uh, the, the transhuman effort, ultimately? Uh, there's no sentimentality, no altruism. Genes are selfish. They're forward-looking. They, 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 they attack the next uh, encroachment on their environment. There's absolutely nothing to... There's nothing that I can see that suggests to me that this this ensuing animal kingdom, which Kelly calls it, is somehow going to assist us or even have a, a, a corner of, of, of sentimentality in their hearts, their metallic hearts, or whatever the hell they're going to have. That's I, I'm extremely trepidatious as I think a lot of people are. Now that may be our our legacy, uh, as as a Paul Davy says, our legacy is to bestow upon the universe the product of our intellect, this this entirely new phyla of of, of silicon based life form. And our job is done. It's not transhumanity. That is a that's a marketing slogan. Transhumanity will be finished in a flash. We're talking about post-humanity, and one of my problems with the debate in its current form, we, we're not being honest, we're being disingenuous. We are manufacturing and participating in our own cessation. That's, that's how I feel. Um, Can you just elaborate a little bit more by what you mean by our own cessation, just to be clear, please? Well, I suppose if you look at like a Daguerreus, a Hugo Daguerreus, he talks about the three classes, the cyborgus, the cos cosmos, and the Terrans. I'm very much a Terran in spirit. I'm a poet. I believe in, in human soul. I believe in human consciousness as the, as the only thing that's real. I, I, I question even the existence of, 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 of objects and, and objective, of, 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 
subjective objects. I, I believe the subjective self is the only reality. I think I share that with a, with an, an amin, uh, the Swami or uh, uh, even Elon Musk very recently spoke of uh, uh, his imagery was very revealing. We're summoning the demon. I believe technology is is a demonic force, and when I say demonic, I mean it is it is ultimately pitted against humanity. It's anti-human. It is nihilistic, and it has its own agenda. So, what is to be done in your view? Then, is it do we kind of abandon technology and go back to the caves? What's the solution? If let's assume you're correct, let's assume that's the case. What do we do? What do we do? Well, first of all, we must acknowledge, and I suspect it's it, the sheer inevitability of it is, is unavoidable. But I think it would have been it would have certainly augmented the debate, maybe even long before where we are today. There's a fascinating quote from Kurzweil. He gets asked, "Well, you know, should we should we participate in this?" And he says, "Well, it's it's too late for that now." You know, that's sort of a it, it's it's a very superficial uh, unexaminedness. There's an unexaminedness in the debate. Have we really contemplated the implications? And frankly, can we stop it? I how do you, how do you stop the Frankensteinian dynamic? I'm not sure. We've never done it. Uh, another uh, Eric Fromm, a, a wonderful uh, quote from Eric Fromm, and I'll, I'm obviously paraphrasing. We have nuclear weapons because technology allowed us to invent them and envision them and create them. And the imperative of technology then is that nuclear weapons must exist. We have no, we have no, there's no human will that can put the genie back in the bottle. I don't know how to, how do we avert change? Or are we being, are we being overly parochial as a species? Are we supposed to accept the fact that we are a baton passing intermediation species and that this is our legacy? Perhaps it's been replicated millions of times around the universe. You know, the carbon-based life form destroys his biosphere, and just in the nick of time, for the successful planets, he manages to, to create a post-human uh, uh, legacy, which then goes out and explores the universe. Uh, who said recently that, that almost certainly, to the extent that we encounter aliens from another planet or galaxy, or uh, they're, they're going to be of a, of a transhuman, post-human uh, machine uh, composition. All right. Um, let me let me just uh, Nick, Nick, you can uh, in the next segment, you can question Norm a bit further. I, I just want to sort of contain this segment. Um, Norm, I just wanted to ask you one question since uh, Nick had defined transhumanism earlier. Uh, it seems to me so far uh, you are speaking. It seems almost like out of fear. And I it, it reminds me of when I've argued with people about eugenics. And I say, well, you know, any time that you have gotten a transplant or uh, there's been a heart valve put in, that's a product of eugenics. People think of eugenics as, for example, just a bunch of Nazis or the Soviet Union or, or yahoos down in the Old South in the 1930s, uh, you know, uh, giving uh, uh, vaccinations or, or seeming vaccinations to black people. Um, is, is your whole objection to transhumanism just simply based on fear or is there something deeper to it? And then we'll go uh, to the questioning of Nick in the next section. Simply uh, fear-based. It's funny you mentioned uh, the Nazis. I think Elon Musk said that uh, he fears that what he calls "quote unquote" the Hitler problem, uh, and, and, and all the all the negative implications of eugenics. Not so much the technology, but perhaps the technology in the hands of nefarious human beings. That's a very real danger. I, I'd like to think my my opinions are informed by more than just pure human fear. Okay. All right. Well, we'll end this segment. In the next segment, uh, Nick will get a chance to, to grill you a bit more about uh, what your opinion is based of and other things that he wants to ask you. And we will do that when we return. All right. In this segment, uh, Norman Ball will be on the hot seat and his questioner will be Nicola. So go ahead, Nick. So, Norman, it seems to me that, let me, let me see if I can surprise you. I would claim that you're more of a Kurtzwellian than I am. And I would claim that you're a little bit inconsistent because of that, if what I just said now is true. Uh, what do I mean by this? So, first of all, you said that 
this kind of a process of technology evolving and stuff cannot be stopped, right? So my question is, is that really so? And if it, let's assume that what you say is true, even though I don't believe that to be the case, but let's assume that that's true. Then if there's nothing we can do about it, then what's the point of this conversation even? But if you are embracing such point of sort of historical, even teleological inevitability, I would say that would make you a lot more of a Kurzweilian than I am, right? Because I actually have come to, to the point that I see the singularity as one potentiality for our future. I see a lot wider spectrum, uh, a, a lot bigger uh, unpredictabilities and, and uh, alternatives than, than that just one vision of the future. And that's why I said that to me, Ray Kurzweil is absolutely, without any doubt, a genius visionary. But that doesn't mean that that one vision is the only vision we can have. And it doesn't mean that it's the correct vision or, 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 or um, the, the, the fact that, that we are kind of embracing that sort of inevitability line limits both our engagement with the vision itself, but also seeking potential alternatives. So I, I just want to say it, it's a little bit self-defeating and inconsistent if on the one hand you're saying, Oh, it's terrible. It's kind of nihilistic. It's it's the end of humanism, but it's inevitable, and there's nothing we can do about it, right? So in that way, what can we do? Like, should we just sit and, and you know get drunk and do nothing until the end of time? Well, what what do you suggest? Well, that's uh, that's beyond my probably beyond my capabilities, Nick. But um, I, I there is a there, there is a an ascent there. There's a uh, a dynamic in technology. Technology does not serve us; we serve it. We attend to it. It uh, it, it has its own it, it has its own trajectory. It's an evolutionary. I think uh, is Kevin Kelly. Biological drives and technology drives are essentially the same thing. Technology technology pursues complexity, uh, ubiquity, uh, uh, socialization. Uh, a lot of technologies service other technologies. Uh, they attend to one another. Uh, we're creating it. That's the classic Kurzweilian vision, by the way, right? It's the teleo teleological vision. The world, the cosmos, the universe, according to that vision, moves from dumb to smarter, to smarter, to biological evolution, which will eventually be sort of uh, uh, kind of reached in perhaps around the human form. And then eventually will be replaced by technological evolution until, as we say, or as Kurzweil says, the universe wakes up one day and we have computroniums, matryoshka brains and smart dust. And so you have this kind of a very directed teleological, nice and clean line of dumb, stupid universe and very smart, brilliant universe until there is no dumb matter left in it anymore. And that's a vision, but it's only one vision. And there's many alternatives. And for example, let me give you just one other. Exactly the opposite. So the Kurzweilian view, which you expose to us, says that intelligence rides the ship and biology, or eventually technology, is the tool or the ship. And so intelligence is the primary driver and for now it's been biology and eventually in the future it will be technology, which would be the vehicle of expansionism of that intelligence. An alternative view is exactly the opposite view, which is to say intelligence is the passenger and technology is the uh, and biology is the driver. In other words, if you look at it in evolutionary terms, not always do life evolves from simple to complex organisms and not always uh, does it evolve from dumb to smart. Sometimes there's regress. There's actually a number of very interesting cases in which certain kinds of organisms have lost their, have lost their brain. And the brain is of, or intelligence is very expensive and it's only useful 
to the degree that the biology trying to take advantage of that brain with respect to survival can use it as a tool. Sometimes, however, it's a very expensive tool. It requires a lot of calories, it requires a lot of energy, it requires a lot of volume, it requires a lot of very specific uh, uh, physical conditions and tight tolerances of survival. And if you are a bacteria or if you are the evolved organism, in a number of cases, you actually have a much higher probability of survival. Uh, so, in other words, you are embracing that Kurtzwellian mythology. Let me give you another example, which perhaps would make it a little bit easier to understand why it's not always the case that intelligence is useful. Take me or you or anyone you want and put us on a desert island and take a chimpanzee and a cockroach and put them there. Who are you going to place your bet on? If you go 10 years later and you want to see which one of us has survived, the intelligent us, the chimp, or the cockroach, I would place the bet on the human the last. I would actually bet against the human almost any time. So if you think of survivability and intelligence has been a tool simply to increase survivability, that's not necessarily the case. So that sort of Need teleological uh, directive that Kurzweil often sort of quotes is one thing that I have totally abandoned personally, and it actually limits our vision terribly. And, and I would say it's one of his greatest flaws, perhaps, in, in terms of his vision. Mm -hmm. So what, what? What about that? Well, that's a, that's a mouthful, uh, Nick. Uh, you know, you you could you you could accuse me of a lack of imagination for misconstruing what it is to be a human being. Uh, I may be I may be married to antiquated notions of humanity, uh, such that uh, I, I what what I what I'm claiming to be human, what I'm claiming that we may possibly be leave, leaving behind, is not human at all. It is, it is the current shell or carapace, and uh, that, that's, that's an argument. I wonder, though, about consciousness. That, to me, is the elephant in the room, the unaddressed. I, I don't know. We don't know what consciousness is. I, I was struck by something I read recently. Ed Witten, who is you know, the M-string M uh, you know, genius. He's, a, he's probably, if you got all the physicists in the world in a room, they would vote almost unanimously. He's the brightest physicist alive today arguably the most intelligent scientist. He said a fascinating thing, and it stuck with me the, the, at least the last two years since I first encountered it. He said consciousness is a permanently, this is a quote, uh, consciousness is a permanently withheld mystery. In other words, it will never be fully expropriated by science. It is something that exists outside materialistic science, will never be brought, in, brought into the house of, of science. What, what is it? It is the it's the ultimate grounding of being. How, how do we plan to replicate this? And, and first of all, when we don't know what it is in any empirical sense, we can't validate it. And yet it seems to be the, 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 the realest thing in, 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 that, that we know. Um, I, 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 I don't claim to have the answer to the question, but I, somehow I think that, that uh, you know, speeding, the, the, uh, you know, uh, what is it? The human brain is what, 10 to the 16th bits per second processing speed we're talking about. 10 to the 40, like 24 zeros, a trillion, trillion, uh, in, in, in handheld devices in, in a short, short period of time. Somehow this, this brute force velocity of computer, and, and, and you'll have some sort of neural substrate in addition to computational speed and power. I understand that. Uh, but even in, with nanotechnology, even when these things are, are when, when we break through these various thresholds, there seems to be, the, in my mind, the simplistic conclusion or assumption that somehow consciousness will spring out of this sheer brute force and, and, and when we break through these various thresholds we don't know what consciousness is and, and I, I would suggest you're overvaluing something that we don't know how important it is right so again if you look at it from an evolutionary point of view you are kind of putting a central role of consciousness you're making it somehow special in other words I think that you have to make an argument as to why that should be the case. 
I mean, bacteria are incredibly resilient and they've been around for 4 billion years and are likely to remain after us. And they're not conscious, uh, or at least that's the presumption. We don't, we don't presume that bacteria is conscious. Uh, but chances are they will be around even after the singularity. And maybe after humanity, most likely after humanity too, whether in one version or another, and, and, and even in, an, in, in most apocalyptic and or dystopian view, we only focus on our special place in the universe. So again, you're putting sort of this uh, teleological, even if you will, sort of divine position of humanity and our attributes such as consciousness. Well, I am a Christian. I'm a Christian, and, and hence, hence, ah, I'm, okay. I'm, All right. I'm a now that makes sense. Sure. Yes. Okay. And I'm an eschatologist, which is essentially a teleologist. I do believe that history yes. is directed and meaningful, and has it has a terminus. I do believe that. In fact, okay. now that explains it. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I'll raise a lot of eyebrows to say that I, I believe there is a there is a climactic end to human history, and I believe this is actually a dark foreboding of some of the things that, that are some of the precursors to that dark end. But that's that's a little bit, that's going to raise a lot of eyebrows, particularly in the scientific community. But I, uh, I the, you, you're making some, some, you're obviously quite well versed in this, in this, in this realm. Uh, I, I think about Jacques Lel. He talks about uh, the idea that technology is free. And, and we may be, your, your point may be that uh, we're being too chauvinist. I'm being too chauvinistic. People of my, of, of my thinking are chauvinistically misconstruing what humanity is. Uh, are, oh, yeah, are... tell, us, tell us, by the way, because I was wondering, like, if you're saying that something will be lost, right? I mean, let us be clear and specific. What is it that you say it will be lost? Because for me, as a, as a non-Christian philosopher who have been seeking that answer, uh, and I've been kind of referring th that that sort of, interest of mine through the eyes of the philosophers of the last several thousand years, I fail to find a definition uh, of humanity that we embrace. So please tell me, what is humanity and what is that, that which you say will be lost? Well, I think our souls will be lost. And I think souls, we, we get into some semantics and some fuzzy metaphysical semantic issues, but I think souls, consciousness, God, I think somewhere in that crosshair, they're all the same thing. I think God is within us, and I believe in souls. I believe souls can be lost. I believe we can create golems that are soulless creatures of immense intelligence that almost obliviously could, could, could erase us. But Is I, artificial intelligence going to be those golems that you call? Well, artificial intelligence, would you not agree? It's, it's, it's sort of been a d disappointment. It's been demoted over the, over the decades. It became uh, intelligent agents and it became expert systems. These are a series of euphemistic demotions. Artificial intelligence, some of the top AI, I, AI people are, 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 are rather skeptical, down, have downgraded it. it. It didn't live up to expectations, did it? It's oh, sure. A, a disappointment in many ways. He, well, it, it depends. Like, I... Uh, you can say that, you know, humanity has been striving to, to fly since the myth of Daedalus and Icarus and has been continuously failing to accomplish that feat for, you know, something like three or four thousand years until one day it, it did accomplish it. And today, every one of us has flown and, and most of us, at least in the developed world, find it kind of a, a common experience, which, 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 which we do probably at least once a year. And kind of affordable and we don't think twice about it so uh, this is what change is all about it's like something that has been there for millennia and then suddenly a couple of bicycle makers come around and throw a, a brunch into the spoke of history and break the wheel and we move into a different realm this is what change is all about and if i've learned one thing from history and that's that change will always be there uh, and, 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 you know, those kinds of sort this, of... Let me suggest, Nick, this is the, the, the last Corwell statistic I read. The 21st century will create 20,000 20, years of knowledge at the when measured by... Change. By, 
by, by the rate of 20th century knowledge growth. It's, it's a blistering speed. I would suggest it is. it is a singularly inhuman speed. It all but repeals human agency from the gathering and from the, the, the digestion of knowledge. It is, it is, what is driving this? It's not, a, it's, it's not, it's, it, it, it's not amenable to, to human intellect. Uh, we are at right. By so virtue. there's two key words in your claim there, human and agency, right? Yes. So right now we're still fuzzy on the human end of things. What is human? I, I personally don't find a, a satisfactory answer on, on that from you. Uh, and second, like we will need to, to kind of talk a little bit about what agency stands for so that then we'll be in a better position to kind of evaluate your claim that it's impermeable to human agency, right? My take on things will be that depending, your answer to that question is very much dependent on the meaning you put on those two terms, right? What does it mean to be human? That's why those answers are so crucial. And what is agency, right? Does agency mean full control? Does agency mean riding the wave like a surfer? A surfer doesn't have control over the ocean. In fact, they go out in the biggest storm, which is to say in a situation where they're completely out of control. And yet, people have managed to do incredible uh, uh, surfing on, on some of the biggest, most monstrous waves in the history of, of storms. Uh, and, and, and does that is that some kind of agency or not? So the terms are important here. Is that some kind of agency? Well, yes, I suppose, uh, you know, harnessing or pretending to harness the forces of nature and the forces of technology, we are we are really in a pretender role as, as agents. Uh, I mean, I would imagine, I, to my mind, agency implies some level of directedness and control. And I think that directedness and control is largely an illusion. I think there is a small cadre of technocrats who feel, and they're just, it's primate exhilaration. They think they're controlling that wave. They're, it must be quite exhilarating to, to be at, at, at these levels of, of human achievement. I mean, that's I, I, quite intoxicating. But, at the, but these people are what I think Yaron Lanier calls the, the inverted, uh, the, the, um, uh, cybernetic totalists. The, the, the idea that souls don't exist, uh, we, we're, we're, we're cybernetic patterns, a series of that, that just waiting to be decoded and understood. Uh, there is not, there is no solidity in, in what humanity is. And I, I can't pretend to operate definitive definition of humanity. Is it a process? Is humanity a continual? Is it a very uh, provisional sense of agency? Uh, can, sh should we accept the fact that we have a an intermediating provisional role to play? Is 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 it our, are we fully recognizing our humanity by by handing the baton off? Some of the, the most preeminent scientists say human, uh, unaugmented humanity probably has a hundred years left to live, anyways. So, in the absence of some augmentation, if not even a, a complete abdication of humanity, we, we're probably on 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 numbered days, anyways. And how is that different from the days we were on the savanna, for example? We had no control over anything. We didn't have control over the next meal at that time, right? We were, which is why, you know, today when we overeat, our food becomes, you know, fat, which is potential energy for a later period because our body evolved on the savanna and basically has learned the hard way that every time you have some more food, you'd better store it because you're not guaranteed that you're going to get the next meal. So you're saying we don't, we're relinquishing agency. I'm saying is that let's talk specifically what agency means and let's look at that historically speaking. From the beginning, from the dawn of humanity, we've never had agency in that very strict kind of classical way that you want to push forward. In fact, if we've ever had agency, it's only been because of our technology, because of our science, and because of our ability to utilize them as tools in order to put some order 
and predictability in our life and make some control over our environment to the best of our degree. And I would say, in fact, those have been statistically and historically speaking, our best tools. And, and, and that's why in the beginning of our conversation, I ask you what, let's assume you're absolutely correct. What are we to do? Are we supposed to, as Samuel Butler said, you know, destroy all technology and take destroy all the machines and sort of return ourselves to the world in a sort of a pre-industrial revolution state? Because like, personally speaking, I don't see that as an answer, even if we assume that you're correct in what you're saying, because that would mean giga death. Basically, the vast majority of humanity cannot survive without our technology today. It's impossible. And not to mention that our lives at that time were nasty, brutish, and short, as uh, Thomas Hobbes, I think it was, who put it. So Hobbes, yeah. Right. Yeah. So what do you propose? And, and and if we assume that you're right, and, and then again, are you really right? What You want agency and you want control, but have we ever really had it? And is it not the case that to the degree we've had it, only science and technology that have given us that? Uh, you know, and therefore, more science and technology should not be something to scare us and be fearful of, but, but something to give us more confidence that we will be more in control. So, for example, people wouldn't have to die from diseases that they're dying today. People wouldn't have to, to you know, a library doesn't have to burn every time a human being dies. You know, uh, we would be in control and in, in, we'll have absolutely unique capability to reduce human suffering better than ever before and to the degree that we have managed to do that it's only been through science and technology go ahead Noam. it's it's a it's a curious way to to pose a dilemma uh nick it, the singularians are saying we're about to subject humanity to an utter free fall from all angles all at once that's what the sing that's what the criswellian singularity is that is but a th how that's is that a, different since throwing us onto the savannah and making us cancer gatherers and uh, dealing with the elements yeah. and and dealing with fires and dealing with earthquakes well, these are, and you know, these are, yeah you know, nick let it let, let him answer go ahead mom you know, read your insurance policy. These are acts of God. These are exogenous events. Yeah, of course, we were subjected to uh, hurricanes and tornadoes and meteor showers and all sorts of things that we have utterly no control over. But I think this uh, there, there is a, a level of human agency in this. I don't know that it's enough to, to avert what the singularity that we're, we're approaching. But the singularity is, I, I, I would say, a series of, of uh, if you will, black swans that are occurring simultaneously. Uh, and 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 there are there are active human efforts to bring us to that point. To, that there, people are making great strides to 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 create that very situation. Then they turn around and say, "Well, by the way, do you have an alternative?" Well, one alternative would be not to not to be such an active and and you know participant in this massive uncertainty. Uh, but but they're they're certainly not going to sanction themselves and stop nor do i think they can i as i as i've said technology is its own master we don't master technology we pretend to that's hubris hubris is the is the false belief that we are guiding and directing technology when in fact technology is is guiding itself and using us as its attendants its intermediate attendants and, and it, at some point will no longer need our assistance and will become essentially as, as a kelly would say its own animal kingdom uh, autonomous kingdom. Uh, you know, it's, it's like the dinosaurs with the small mammals at their feet. You know, they, little did they know they were they were in amongst the you know the usurping uh, animal and a phylo and mam mammal class. Uh, so you're asking, what's the alternative? Well, the alternative would be to turn off the spigot called change. Then you ask, well, how do you do that? And I said, that's that's extremely difficult because that that spigot is is it doesn't appear to be available to us, uh, and I don't know who I don't know who controls that spigot or if it can be turned off. This this is an evolutionary process. Maybe we are to resign ourselves to the fact, or, or glory in the fact that we we are a a species on a planet that 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 was privileged enough to reach this point 
just as our biosphere is disintegrating, uh, it, it's rather serendipitous that this this opportunity exists for us to, to propel ourselves beyond this planet into the stars and the heavens. Maybe that is our legacy, and we should be quite satisfied with that. That that's that's not a bad that that's a job well done. I, in some quarters, I would think for for, for any species. Uh, Nick. No, there's nothing apocalyptic about that. And, and let me say, I agree with you on a couple of points, but I would even push them further, right? So the one that I would push further is the one about hubris. You're saying that, okay, it's hubris to think we can control technology. I would say it's hubris to think we can control anything other than ourselves. It's my approach to life generally is this, you know, life is what happens to you while you're making other plans. I have control over my actions. That's what I stand for philosophically and ethically speaking. That's as far as my control spans. And that's kind of a very stoic perspective, if you will. Whatever, so I am responsible for my actions. Whatever happens outside of that realm of control of mine, happens in life but i it's hubris to think that i can control anything else other than my own action so take for example if you have kids you can't control your kids at best you can be their good guide and their mentor in the end of the day they will make their own choices we've never had that kind of control that you're talking about that kind of agency that you're talking about right and that's 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 Kind of where I want to push it even further and deeper than than you say. Well, a leading a leading transhumanist, I suppose, could recuse himself from the entire activity and, and retire or, or or shut the laboratory door and lock it. Uh, you know, that's that that would be an exercise of human will. I, you know, you, the very human decision not to participate in this juggernaut. That that, but that here's be... where I say no. Here's where I say exactly the opposite. And here's where my kind of mission comes in. So, uh, and, and my work in the last six years. So I cannot control anything outside of my realm. But what I can do is, is, is I can do the best that I can to guide and to set up the context so that other people can make the best decisions they can, they can make to themselves. And in the aggregate, hopefully that will make a difference right and this is also another place where we we disagree a little bit in, a, in an interesting way uh because you th you're a lot more on the inevitability line of, of thinking with respect to the singularity i am a lot less uh, i am onto the probability end rather than the inevitability end right and, and and this is where my mission comes in i believe we can make a difference i believe we can our decisions that we make today and in the next couple few decades can shape and direct the technological singularity if it were to occur in different ways and that's why it's very important what we do what we stand for the kinds of choices we make and, and that's where my role comes in to kind of set the context set the debate lay out the ground with the possibilities allow people to see the options, make them ponder, and hopefully make the best choice, not only for themselves individually, but as far as humanity collectively, too. Well, now, Nick, I've already complimented you on your interview series. So, no, I, and you, you do just that. I, I, I wasn't, that wasn't rhetoric. I do watch your interviews, and you do an exceptional job. And I thank you for, for you, you, you cast a very wide net.
uh, we, we couldn't avert it. There is a, there is an inevitability about it. It's, it. It is that evolutionary engine. It's going to happen despite us. Uh, I do, on a political, you know, geopolitical standpoint, I believe there is a there is an echelon of people on this planet, a very small group, that do not believe in in, in, in limitless bounty for all of humanity. I believe this this technology is going to be shepherded. I believe they're they're of an exceptionalist caste. They're going to hold it to themselves. I I have a I'm afraid to say, and, and maybe it's fear based. I I see that the the, the larger body of humanity will not be beneficiaries of these technological advances and that may be another evolutionary function why do we need seven billion people on the planet i'm not entirely sure uh what is the optimal number what is the meaning of, of humanity in the aggregate uh so so I, I see radical attrition i i look at this i look at the markets i see huge secular deflationary trends the markets are the collective wisdom of, of the, the, the smartest minds on the planet. Uh, they're pointing to lower costs. Uh, commodities are losing their, their, their precious value status. Uh, employment is going to become a, a rare beast. We're, 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 the robotics are going to curtail, uh, you know, journeyman employment. All the, uh, you know, the things that billions of people do every day will be superseded. What's going to happen to these people? Obviously, they're going to die of attrition. We know that. Uh, but what is it? What's the optimal and sustainable number? And and so when we when we it is a very fluidic notion, Nick. When we talk about humanity, what is humanity? Well, I'm humanity today, but when I die, I no longer will be. Everyone who was here today in 80, 90 years will no longer be here, unless of course you know Kurzweil's immortality dreams are consummated. Uh, so so you know. We're asking what humanity is. I mean, we're, we're uh, these debates take us to the most fundamental questions, and, and and ultimately the questions that we can't answer. I I can't I can't assign a, a definition to humanity. I can only express my my anxieties and reservations, and 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 urge, I suppose, at the end of the day, urge a sober analysis and a reflection and a reflectiveness that I don't see in a lot of the. Uh, a lot of the speak, I see a lot of people caught up in the whirlwind of events, and, and well, it's inevitable, it's going to happen, and if I don't do it, somebody else will win the Nobel Peace Prize. Okay? Uh, what you were urging there, Norman, well, is, Nick, is Nick, noble. Nick, Nick, if I could just ask you, um, since we're past the half uh, hour mark on, on your segment, could you ask a final question that's a little bit more specific to uh, a Kurzweil opinion? I mean, it, it's been a nice philosophic debate, but if we could a end it with getting back to, to, to the subject. And then I just want to ask a brief question of each of you raising this point, and then in the next segment, Norm will go. So if you could ask a, a final uh, question, Nick. What's the what's your biggest problems with what's your biggest problem with Ray Kurzweil? Well, my, okay, uh, I'm a little bit troubled with his, and then, now we're going to delve a little bit into the personal of Ray Kurzweil. As I, and I, I don't, I certainly don't know him. I've never even sat in a room with him, and, uh, unlike you, something. He has a morbid fixation with the death of his father. And he does. I lost. I lost my father. We will all we, we all lose our fathers in in time. It, it's the natural progression of things. I would love to spend another day with my my father. I uh, and, and probably never will. Uh, it's, I it's, so so there is this psychological psychologic uh, dynamic in in Kurzweil and 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 to uh, to. Uh, let's say maybe even some unresolved issues at the subjective self level uh, that, uh, you know, is this a man who is prepared uh, because of his own personal in unexaminedness, and I'm, I'm being very speculative here, uh, I don't claim to know what sort of counseling or you know, how he's trying to resolve this or what sort of catharsis he's attempting with, with that, but it seems, I can't separate it from uh, his quest for immortality, his, his is he going to subject? Would he be willing to subject all of humanity to some transhuman peril because it's worth it in his psychological makeup to, to, to bring his father back? Now I'll tell you where that that I'll tell you the reverberation that it has for me when I think of Turing and his 
Turing's fascination with machine sentience. At the end of Turing's life, Turing was a tormented homosexual, repressed homosexual. So we so tormented he, him. I'm sorry? We tormented him. Well, he, he, wherever the torment originated, Nick, whether it was society, societally imposed or an internal uh, aversion to whatever, uh, you know, he subjected himself to all sorts of strange uh, uh, hormonal treatments. He, could catch, he, he grew female breasts near the end of his life. He was a, the he was government a, subjected him. That was his sentence. Okay. In court, right? Either go to jail or undergo chemical castration, the byproduct of which was him growing breasts. Okay, that's, that's even more specific. But we're talking about people who in their interpersonal sphere have rather profound profoundly strange and interesting conflicts and there's almost a compensatory dynamic they take these unresolved subjective conflicts and march into the laboratory and inflict frankensteinian visions on the rest of us there is some there's something that gives me disquiet between those two spheres i think you're putting the horse in front of the cart though right because let me say uh Alan Turing was a homosexual, but that that conflict that you call is only a conflict imposed on him through a society that made who he was wrong, ethically and legally, right? So if he were fortunate to be born in a more acceptable place and at a more acceptable time, uh, for example, ancient Greece, at the time of Plato and Socrates, he would have had zero conflict, zero. Or if he was born today in a big metropolitan, uh, gay-friendly uh, community like Toronto, where I live, uh, he would not have had that conflict, uh, or at least to a much lesser degree, ethically speaking, and to zero degree, legally speaking, right? He was persecuted by the British government because in the context of Cold War, the Brits were fearful that uh, he would be liable to blackmail from the Soviet Union spies and because of his homosexuality and thereby betray profound state secrets. And they sort of preemptively uh, sued him for homosexuality, which at the time was illegal uh, in the United Kingdom. And he was sentenced to choose between jail or chemical castration to fix him, to cure him. Yeah. Right? So that's an imposed in external conflict. There's a lot and of you can you can be a healthy homosexual in my view, and you don't need to have a conflict with who you are. All right. Let, 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 that's a point of view. Noam, why don't you just uh, briefly answer that? Then I want to ask a question because I'm going to actually do a show about uh, race and, and, and sexuality in a few months. But we're getting a little off topic. So, Noam, just, uh, if you could just briefly answer or reply to Nick. Yeah, well, there's a lot of reverberations with Oscar Wilde. I mean, I, 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 Absolutely. I, I, I often think of the two similarly in my mind. And, and, and I, I'm not arguing with you, Nick, at all that a lot of these things were externally societally imposed and, and, and the norms and strange, uh, you know, closed mindedness of, of, the, of that era. But at the same time, I feel that uh, almost Turing, in some strange sense, was seeking the warmth and comfort of machines because he was rejected by human society. And that uh, he overinvested in this, this, this machine sentience obsession at, at, at near the end of his life. There's, I, I just. I'm not a psychiatrist, and I don't want to. I don't want to get too deeply into this, but I feel there. I see these these interpersonal dislocations, whether they're imposed within or without, and I feel that they almost. Uh, you know, it, it's it's a Jungian thing. You know, if you, if they're going to bleed in somewhere, and they and and they they show themselves in strange ways in the professional in the vocations of, of these men. There there are, and maybe that's all of us. I mean. Maybe Absolutely. all of it is, to some degree, are fueled by you know inner demons, and and you know that, that that may not be unusual. But these these men are on the world stage, and they have and have and had very formative uh, roles to play. So right. it's an interesting. All right, Norm. Issue. Norm, let's uh, in our next segment we're going to reverse the roles. I just wanted to ask a brief question of each of you just to end the segment because uh, uh, we I do have. Uh, 
uh, less technological savvy and less science savvy uh, viewers, some more artistic people. So I just wanted to clarify a point that you made and then a briefly one that Nick had made. Um, Norm, you you have mentioned golems and agency and, and uh, a lot of this segment got off on uh, the topics of what might generally be called philosophical zombies. Um, and you seem to have a, a lot of problems with that in, in regards to AI. I'm just wondering, uh, is is your problem with that uh, because you are not able to look someone or some machine in the eye and see the soul as you define it? Because it, it seems it seems to me that uh, if I were to meet a robot and it, it seemed to pass, uh, what is it, the, 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 you know, the, the conscious, test. yeah, the Turing test, that I, I wouldn't really give a damn, you know, I mean, maybe it is uh, as in the Star Trek episode set of data that he is a glorified toaster, but I mean, if he, if he can laugh, if he can uh, uh, inform me, if he can be a good companion, uh, you know, a friend or whatnot, it doesn't matter. So what is the basis, uh, is, is the nub that you have against uh, uh, AI, uh, the fact that it's simply not biological or, or what? Many, I, I don't. I, I even know I'm not an expert by any stretch, but I, I don't see uh, AI not being able to, to, to cross these various biological uh, impediments and barriers. I think they'll make great strides in brain, uh, in understanding of the brain and chemistry of the brain and neural pathways and networks and, and that sort of thing. I, I, but, but I believe in a soul. I believe in, I believe in consciousness. I don't think it's replicatable in an object. I believe we are subjects. I believe we are quite unique in that sense. I don't think it's exportable. Okay. I, don't, I don't think technology is going to deliver it. On the contrary, the, the technology is directed against crushing the, 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 the self. It, it, subjective experience is a myth. Okay. Subjective experience, yeah. So let me let me just ask finally, Nick, uh, you uh, a few times so far, and we're about midway through uh, this uh, show, um, you've talked about sort of technology taking us along for a ride. I'm just wondering, do you make any difference between, uh, or do you philosophically see any difference between life or existence itself and a quality of life? In, in other words, uh, you were talking about bacteria. Do you, do you think that's... You talked about bacteria being more successful in terms of evolutionary length of, of time than human beings, but do you but do you not see uh, any difference between something like Norm would say? Well, bacteria can't make a Goya painting. Bacteria can't uh, build a New York City. Bacteria can't send other bacteria to the moon. Uh, do you just see? You know, what what is your opinion on that? So first of all, termites can build incredible architecture. Um, second of all. There's two meanings of quality of life that I want to talk to here. So uh, the first meaning of quality of life that, that I meant, the, the more narrow one, is with respect specifically to humanity. And I suggested that our quality of life has improved tremendously since the time we were on the savannah uh, due to our access to tools such as science and technology. Generally speaking, though, with respect to bacteria, I didn't mean quality of life. I meant survivability and adaptability from an evolutionary uh, point of view. Bacteria is incredibly adaptive, uh, incredibly uh, able to survive in all kinds of places, and they've been, you know, here for four billion years. Now, what I was also raising, and I wasn't making a claim, I was just raising a question, is that that kind of centrality that Norm puts on consciousness, the soul, and humanity is taken for granted. And I'm not saying it shouldn't be taken for granted. I'm just saying it requires perhaps questioning and justification before we do that jump. And then, of course, if you're a Christian uh, and you believe in the soul, then we can see sort of the metaphysics of how you got to be where you are today. And then uh, my only retort, which I haven't undertaken, obviously, is to question your metaphysics if I am to undermine such a position, right? So I, I just want to say that those are things we should keep in mind. All right. Uh, we will end this segment. And when we return, uh, Norman Ball will have his turn to question Nick, and that will be in a moment. <laughs> 